All right, John, thank you so much for joining us. And um, it's, it's really nice for us today to get a chance to know a little bit about your background and how you came to be in your current role at Curtis Wright. Well, hello, Gail. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate the invitation. Sure. I am currently the Vice President of Strategy and Communications at Curtis Wright, which is a public company listed on the New York Stock Exchange, tickers CW. And to understand my role, you kind of have to understand what Curtis Wright is a little bit. And Curtis Wright was originally founded in 1929 when the company started by the Wright brothers and their key competitor, Glenn Curtis, came together along with a few other aviation companies. They became Curtis Wright, so it was over 90 years ago. And during World War II, Curtis Wright was a defense manufacturer, an aerospace company, making airplanes and engines and propellers for the war effort, and stayed predominantly aerospace and defense through the 40s and 50s and somewhat into the 60s. And then in the 60s and 70s and on to today, became very diversified. Mm -hmm. And in the 90s, it had gotten actually much smaller. And we went on a series of acquisitions from the late 90s through the 2000s to become a diversified industrial company of about two and a half billion dollars in sales. And that's where we are today. And I joined Curtis Wright in the mid 2000s and did a lot of those acquisitions as a business development director. But Sorry. that's quite all right. But uh, recently um, I've been the head of corporate strategy and corporate communications. When our current CEO uh, moved into that role, we decided to reorganize and rebrand the company under the moniker One Curtis Wright, because until then, being built through acquisitions, we were a number of disparate, smaller companies, um, not really a holding company, but pretty much a conglomerate. So we decided to come together and be more market facing and branded ourselves as One Curtis Wright. And I volunteered to lead that effort, recognizing that we didn't have a communications team at the corporate level at all. And I became the VP of communications along with my role in corporate strategy. So. It's a little bit of a history of the company and, and how I got to where I am today. And I'd also like to know what inspired you to be in this, in this um, really this field in general. In the 1990s, um, I was in my first job and that was as an army officer. So I spent all the 1990s wearing green in the army. And in late 99, I exited the service and decided to go back to school and get my MBA. Uh, didn't go to Clemson. But I do know a lot of folks who went to grad school at Clemson, uh, just the same. But after my MBA, I was still interested in defense. Uh, I had always been interested in aerospace, and I took a job with a large defense contractor called General Dynamics. It's a giant company. That led to my role here because I actually did some business development, corporate strategy, and corporate mergers and acquisitions with GD, which I have then now done even more so in Curtis Wright. I've been with Curtis Wright for 14 years, since, wow. since mid-2000s, mm -hmm. and originally was hired as a director of business development, and eventually now, again, am the head of corporate strategy and corporate communications. So because of my military background and my background in another defense contractor, it was an easy fit for Curtis mm -hmm. Wright. It certainly sounds like it. What an interesting background and history your company has. It does. Uh, I'm curious to know, before we talk a little more about that, what's currently going on with regard to COVID and how has that uh, sort of changed uh, the way you're doing things? Yeah, it's, it's definitely changed the way we're all doing things, hasn't it? I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out, obviously, how tragic it is for people who are directly affected by it and, mm -hmm. and how thankful we are for the efforts of everybody who's fighting the virus. Curtis Wright is actually very fortunate because being a defense business and an aerospace business, much of our operation has been termed essential by the US government. Mm -hmm. We've therefore been able to stay open in most of our locations. We have a lot of locations that do a, a hybrid of commercial or work as well as defense work. So the defense part of that business has stayed open. Mm -hmm. Therefore, Curtis Wright really hasn't been affected quite as badly as many companies have because we haven't had to shutter our doors completely. Sure. However, it has had a big impact on us, and even more important than the business side is the impact to the employees. We have over 9,000 employees around the world, many of whom have to come to work if, the work if work is open, because if you're a technician on an assembly line, you've got to assemble the parts, and that's done at work. 
but thousands are able to work from home. And, and of course, like many other companies, we established uh, work from home practices almost immediately. Uh, mm -hmm. And we've all been working from home for the past uh, four to six weeks now. The biggest concern there is their well being. How do you ensure that your team and the people who work with you and who you, whom you're used to seeing daily are, are okay? How, how, how you don't really know how a particular crisis might be affecting somebody. So it's really important that our frontline leaders, our immediate supervisors, check in on their folks as much as possible. And we're certainly doing that. For our folks who are coming into work, you know, because as I said, our operations are essential, they have certainly had to flex and adapt to a new reality. Most of the time, uh, somebody might be used to working from an eight o'clock or nine o'clock in the morning start time and work their shift and go home at five or six. Mm -hmm. Now we have people coming in at four, and working till two, and then another shift coming in at three and working till nine or, or something similar just to enable social distancing and to mitigate the spread of the virus, certainly. But all of our employees have been very flexible and very understanding. And clearly they're happy to have the doors open still and to have the job. So Curtis Wright has fared better than a lot of companies, as I said, for sure. It seems like a time when companies are looking to really get creative and think of new ways to do things, look for new opportunities. And, and so that kind of brings us to the question of how innovation works at Curtis Wright, uh, starting with kind of how it's evolved. Uh, over the years and 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 so forth. Could you and, and certainly with the history of the Wright brothers? I mean, how cool is that? I'm sure you own that, you know, space of innovation every day uh, But how has that kind of worked and how do you see it going forward? Well, you're right if the first power flight is in your company's history You can lay a claim to integration being in the DNA of the organization. No mm -hmm. question about that y You heard me talk about how Curtis Wright was built, at least today's Curtis Wright, was built through a series of acquisitions over the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. When a company acquires a bunch of different businesses spread all over the place, each with their own technologies and capabilities, mm -hmm. it can end up very siloed. And it can end up with pockets of expertise littered all over the country and in fact all over the world. We have a lot of facilities in Europe and in the UK and over in Asia. Innovation has always happened in all of those businesses, but it hasn't always happened in a coordinated fashion at the corporate level. 18 months ago, we embarked on a new innovation journey in Curtis Wright, and I raised my hand and volunteered to lead that. Mm -hmm. And our charter was to develop what I now call an innovation operating system for the company. The goal is to establish one way of innovating in Curtis Wright. Now, that doesn't mean that every design team has to follow the exact same R&D process. Because if you're designing a pump for a nuclear submarine, that R&D process is going to naturally be very different than if you're deciding, designing an electronic shifter for a freightliner truck or caterpillar tractor. Mm -hmm. Obviously, those are very different products with very different uh, requirements and concerns, and the design process is different. However, the innovation process can be largely the same. You still have to start with a corporate strategy or a business strategy and d define a need. You have to go through a stage gate or stepwise process to turn uh, to develop an idea uh, to address that need, turn that into actually an innovation project and see it through whatever your design process is. Mm -hmm. And that's what we developed. Again, we call it an innovation system for all of Curtis Wright that leverages the resources we already had in the corporation. Of course, we already had a corporate intranet. We had um, all of the IT uh, facilities and capabilities. We had labs around the country. We have all these fantastic and wonderful engineers uh, with great ideas. Mm -hmm. We just didn't have a way to tie it all together. Mm -hmm. And that's what our operating system does. We launched that enterprise system, the enterprise innovation operating system in August, and then quickly realized that we needed something better than a network-based file system to manage it 
and migrated to a customized software system that we now use that I call CW Innovation. And we launched that in March, just a few months ago. And already there are, as of my last check, over 116 new, brand new innovative ideas that have been input into our innovation system from all over the company. And the beauty of it is that any employee can access the system. It's simply, it's cloud-based. You can access it on your computer or a mobile device even, and you can input an idea and it goes into our innovation operating system and it gets tracked and progressed through that stage gate process and hopefully becomes something that's either a process improvement, it could be an internal idea, an innovation for how do we do something better, or a technology or even a product that eventually we market and sell. And I think I heard you say at one point that um, these individuals are connected then with a mentor of some sort, or you called, a, I think, a different name, but someone to actually kind of guide them through the process. That's right. Because once again, our folks are spread out all over. So we don't have the luxury of having a large design center someplace where that's the, that's the innovation factory where it all gets done. The magic happens behind these doors. Well, the magic happens behind doors all over the place. Within Always. The right. So, uh, but our cloud-based innovation system enables people to talk to each other and collaborate. When an individual submits an innovation idea, and again, it can be a process improvement. It doesn't have to be uh, for a, a technology or a product-based idea. Depending on where they work, either geographically where they work or in what business unit they work or perhaps what functional organization they're a part of. Maybe they're part of the finance organization. Mm -hmm. But depending on kind of where they work, that idea is assigned a key role and that person is called an innovation champion. And the innovation champion is what makes the whole thing work within Curtis Wright. The innovation champion is somebody who is senior enough to be able to guide the individual, the idea submitter through the process, and also be an intermediary between that individual and business leaders. So it might be a senior engineer who works in a particular business unit who's used to interfacing with the general manager of that business unit. And somebody in that business unit submits an idea the system pings the, the innovation champion, the new innovation champion, he, gets, he or she gets an email, can log into the system, read the idea, look at any attachments or watch any videos that the idea submitter uploaded, mm -hmm. and then calls the idea submitter or shoots them an email and says, hey, I'm the innovation champion that's assigned to your idea, tell me about it, let's walk it through the process and see what makes sense. And then as it matures, Mm -hmm. That innovation champion literally is a champion for the idea to the business leader and go to the business general manager and say, this is a great idea. It now probably needs a little bit of seed money. It needs a little bit of investment to can you continue through the process. Does mm -hmm. it make sense to carve out some of our R&D funds to support it and wow. can be an advocate for it if, if appropriate. That innovation champion is also sort of the first line of defense of ideas that maybe aren't quite right for prime time. Yeah. <laughs> you can say, uh, very nicely that, you know, that's a really neat idea, but it probably doesn't fit what we're looking for. So let's archive that. And, if, but, but thank you very much. And then, or, 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 or potentially say kind of gently, you could, maybe you could try this, or maybe you could think about this or have you thought about, you know, but maybe be the person that kind of helps bring something along that, um, might, might not be quite ready for an audience and so forth. And, and there's actually a third possibility too. Uh, one neat aspect of the software tool that we use, we use, allows the combination of ideas. So as somebody puts in an idea for you know, a hydrogen powered airplane, mm -hmm. just to make up an idea, the system will immediately go and search all of the other content that's already in the system against hydrogen, airplane, powered airplane, and respond back and say, hey, is your idea like one of these five other ideas that have already been that. that somebody might be working on someplace yeah. that, that someplace else and you don't even know those folks and they might be doing that? If so, why don't you link your idea to them and get together and collaborate? Mm -hmm. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how all of that plays out because the collaboration component of this should provide significant benefits to Curtis Wright. Mm -hmm. 
we always had people designing and developing things and coming up with new ideas in their own silos. But now somebody in Minnesota can submit an idea that somebody in Switzerland takes a look at and says, you know what? Our power supply would work perfectly for what that person wants to do in, in that electric actuator. Yeah. Let me go ahead and become part of that team and we can work together to developing a new product. So that's kind of where the synergy should come from and, and, and the magic should happen, hopefully. But it's early days. We'll see. It's a bit of an experiment, too. Yeah, I love that. So it's a bit of an experiment. You did some benchmarking. You looked around at maybe what might work with your organization based on what might might have been done with other organizations and, and found potentially uh, what could work best for you all. Um, are there any particular goals that you have um, with what you've put in place um, and um, what might be some of the challenges uh, going forward with your innovation, um, uh, your process? Certainly, there, there, we certainly have goals. First and foremost, we are a public company and we're, we don't innovate just for the sake of innovating. We do want to create either process improvements to, to improve efficiency or at the end of the day, develop technologies and products that our customers, either today's customers or tomorrow's customers, will value um, and eventually turn into sales for the company. That's why we're here. Um, but beyond that, a goal of mine is for not our two or 3,000 really smart engineers to use the system to innovate, because they will and they already are. My goal is for the other 6,000 people who previously never had a venue for mm -hmm. collaboration and submitting their ideas to become engaged and to really drive a true culture of innovation through the corporation. You can argue that a culture of innovation exists in our design teams, mm -hmm. in our engineering centers, mm -hmm. unquestionably, but does it exist in a finance shared services center? Mm -hmm. Why couldn't it? Why couldn't somebody in finance say, I have a great idea on how to close the books a day quicker. Yes. Let's submit that through the innovation system and mm -hmm. see if we can put some resources behind it and flesh it out and make it work. That, that could easily be a, a, a great success story coming out of our innovation operating system. And I think it will be because more and more people are learning about the system. More and more people are logging on every week. And I think it will it'll only grow. It just takes a little bit of a little bit of time to build momentum and constant communication, of course, and constant learning. So that's a goal of mine for the system <laughs> is, is for a lot more people to use it than just engineers. Right. So even human centric ideas, um, especially in this time um, that we're in ideas that might improve morale or, you know, um, mm -hmm. do something socially responsible, but it, it sounds like you're open to looking at almost any kind of innovative idea that might enhance your company, enhance your culture, enhance what you're putting out in the world. No question about that. The system doesn't know whether or not you're talking about uh, the latest and greatest high temperature sensor that goes inside a jet uh, engine mm -hmm. or a new onboarding process for HR. How do we onboard employees in a total, totally distant or geographically dispersed you know, context, mm -hmm. whereas they don't have to come in? How do we conduct job interviews uh, only on Zoom? You know, if, are there different procedures? Is there a better way to do it that we haven't thought of yet? Mm -hmm. If somebody comes up with an idea, they can enter it through the system. It gets logged. It gets tracked. Mm -hmm. gets reported out on. Uh, so I think that the, the innovation system is sufficiently flexible mm -hmm. to enable a great idea from, from anywhere. Yeah. It sounds like the timing of your innovation system is excellent um, at this particular uh, juncture. We, we all need more innovation. Um, do you see any challenges to going forward in terms of just um, the innovation system in general and, and what would you think about that? One challenge that I hope we face is that we truly have more great ideas than the resources to apply, to apply against them. Mm -hmm. Because in any engineering company like ours, you have an R&D budget, mm -hmm. but you, you only have a finite number of people who can execute that R&D. And we're talking from a technical perspective. So setting aside the process improvements that we discussed for a moment. I could incre increase my R&D budget by 
But if I don't have 20% more people mm -hmm. to execute on it, then is it doing me really any good? Can I apply the resources both from a, yeah, a dollar perspective, but especially a human perspective, a mm -hmm. talent perspective to execute on my innovation plans? Uh, that's a question that we ask ourselves. And I think that we're going to, you know, after we get through today's issue or crisis uh, and downturn after, after we get through that and come out the up, uh, come on the upside of it and are growing again significantly, I expect us to be resource constrained. I expect us to say, hey, you know, you know, we've got our business that's growing again and we would like to apply people against these projects and we're going to have to make some trade-offs and some decisions. Mm -hmm. But that's fine. That's the way business works. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully, through our new innovation process and innovation system, what we do apply our resources to, the bets we do make are better bets and um, made with more discipline and will, will you know, yield even greater returns uh, at the end. Absolutely, and I'm sure you're creating the communication and the narrative to encourage people to step up and to share ideas. And although it sounds like engineers are very excited to have a place to put their new ideas, other people might feel a little bit more vulnerable in doing so, uh, but you've clearly paved the way for them to do that in a very comfortable way, um, certainly with your innovation champion. I think so and hope so. And that's a good insight you have. It, it, it could be a concern that somebody might not want to put their idea out there for all to see because one aspect of our system, it, which encourages collaboration, is one where potentially thousands of people could see the idea that you submitted and be afforded the opportunity to comment on it because it's sort of a, a crowdsourcing component of the system. That comes with pluses and minuses. There's obviously synergy there. We could learn a lot from the collective intelligence and creativity of the organization. But there is a concern that some people might have that, well, I'm not so sure what kind of comments I might receive back, so I don't know if I really want to put it out there. Mm -hmm. We do try and mitigate that uh, because it is the comments are visible. I don't think we're going to see sort of the social media vitriol you might see, you know. Yeah in you know outside of a corporate context mm -hmm. i'm not really worried about people acting unprofessionally in the system sure. mm -hmm. but i do understand that people might feel a little bit vulnerable and you're right the innovation champion who again is a person who if they don't know the submitter directly they they certainly are familiar with where he or she works mm -hmm. the business that they're in or the function that they're in they'll know the same people that mm -hmm. the submitter knows and they should be able to mitigate some of that because it goes back to the locality aspect of it. The, this is, yes, part of Curtis Wright, but also somebody who knows me and knows where I work is involved in this process. It's not just some corporate process somewhere else a thousand miles away. So you're creating a safety there uh, for those individuals. And, and it sounds as if um, you might see ideas that bubble up for that particular site where that individual is located, but I definitely heard you say uh, ideas could come up where there's almost a system in place that's going to cross-reference and connect so that they may be from, you know, um, Asia and it may be an idea out of the U.S. Who knows what, what could happen? Yep, that's exactly right. And I hope that happens. In fact, We've already seen that happen. Um, we have, uh, I use the example of Switzerland because we have a facility there in Switzerland. And last week, myself and a few others were reviewing an idea and said, you know what? I know that our business in Switzerland was in this market. We were talking about a particular market segment uh, that the idea might, uh, might serve. Mm -hmm. um, so we tagged them in the system and brought them in. And now they're part of the collaboration team for that particular idea. And if it becomes an innovation project moving forward, I don't expect they're going to have to provide their own resources, but they might provide some technical expertise or sure. maybe be part of a technical review down the line. Mm -hmm. Or maybe pull in at the right time their business development people who know that particular market segment and could provide some insight as we you know, move the idea further along in our process and becomes ready to be to develop that business plan and then a marketing plan on down the line. So that's how we plan to really 
take advantage of the breadth of our company uh, by developing and instituting a system that encourages that kind of collaboration and makes it easy to do. Mm -hmm. Because in, in the past, a year ago or two years ago, the folks in Switzerland may never have learned about a particular innovation or an idea that they could contribute to. But now it's very easy to tag them and bring them into the system. And, and you didn't even need a functional matter expert to do it because if they have ideas in the system, again, it'll automatically uh, mm -hmm. match up keywords and then, and then give the idea submitter an overview of the other content that's in the system that might be like there. So that's another way all of this could kind of happen organically without even somebody knowing to bring somebody in. It's interesting as well. I, mean, I hear you talking about engaging employees at different levels in different locations and in new ways. And now we're getting more comfortable engaging via Zoom and other uh, other technologies. So um, uh, it seems like that will have a multiplier effect in terms of what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, for, um, for MBA students who are listening to you, um, I hope you don't mind if I shift gears for just a moment, but I want to ask you a few more questions that might be just a little bit more, more personal, um, because MBA students are always looking at, at, at what successful people are doing and looking to emulate and looking to, you know, forge their own career, even working professional MBAs, which many of our two thirds of our students are. But could you tell me, as you look back over your career, um, I'd like to know maybe something you might share with us in terms of what you feel most proud about. Without naming names, I, honestly, I could say I'm most proud of the accomplishments of the folks that I've had the ability or the privilege to work with, and especially folks who worked on teams that I was leading. So I believe really one of the primary duties of any leader is to help ensure the success of the people that are working with you. Mm -hmm. And I've had some great folks who I was just, you know, by virtue of, of timing, just a, a few years further along in my career than they were. Mm -hmm. and, and they were on teams that I, that I led. And we were able to develop personal and professional development plans for them, lever some resources to get them the kind of training or the extra school that uh, they needed or wanted to go to, and really looked out for great career opportunities for them. And you have to be willing as a leader to let the folks on your team spread their wings and go do something else. Yeah. You see that a lot today where nobody wants to give up a, a high potential or a strong performer because how do I replace that person? You know, that's a short-sighted view and it doesn't really do justice to the individual. And in the long term, it's not good for the organization either. Uh, you really want to spread around your high potential and high performing folks. And, and I've had some folks do that and it's really rewarding when you when you see that and it's it's kudos to them but I'm, I'm proud that they were able to achieve what they achieved certainly um and, you know personally i'm pretty proud of some of the different negotiations i entered into when i was running mergers and acquisitions uh, obviously i can't name them but it gets a it gets uh really interesting at times and it can be a lot of fun and very rewarding when if you go to bed at night and you could, you would bet a hundred dollars that this deal is dead and it's not going to survive and there's no way. And then you wake up with an idea and says, no, wait a second, if we do this and I offer them that maybe we can come to an agreement. And there's usually an agreement to be had, not always, mm -hmm. but there usually is if you can, if you're creative enough and flexible enough and patient enough. And I've, I've gone through a few of those in my career and really enjoyed it. And so I'm, I'm proud of that as well. That's really exciting. Um, what about how do you get yourself in that creative space? You know, when you're the creative frame of mind, when you've really got to work on something and look at it from many angles. Yeah, to me, my kind of creativity, honestly, is problem solving. Mm -hmm. Because I wasn't gifted with the ability to, you know, write a concerto or, uh, or paint a beautiful picture. Uh, I, I don't think, unless it's paint by numbers. But uh, certainly when confronted with a very challenging problem, one can apply creativity, right? I mean, you, you have a lot of examples in our daily lives of people who came up with new and creative ways to solve a problem or even solve a problem that people didn't realize that they had. Mm -hmm. That is a bit of a process for me. And 
it really does literally start with, you know, the, the classic clean sheet of paper. For me, it's a clean whiteboard. So I'll go into an office that has, you know, a giant whiteboard on it. And I will first write down the problem statement as I know it. Then I'll write down the resources that I have or we have as a group that can be applied. And that to me just gets the wheels turning and it sparks creativity. I don't know if I'm a, a, a above or below average creative person, to be honest with you, but I do enjoy the problem solving process. Mm-hmm. And to me also, once you kind of go through steps, you diagram out maybe what you want to do, you will always get to a stumbling block. You know, it's like the classic writer's block, right? You'll get to a point where I don't really know how to go forward. Let it, let it sit for a while. Go do something else. Yeah. Sleep on it overnight or longer than that. Mm-hmm. If it's a weekend, you know, if, if you enjoy going outside or go play golf or tennis or do whatever you like, go for a bike ride, wherever you want to do and clear your head and then come back to it Monday morning and things might look different. And that's actually, a, for me, uh, definitely a part of the creative process is, is, is giving things time to sort of, as mm-hmm. I said, percolate, to sort of, uh, uh, you know, mull them over a little bit. But I love, actually, I enjoy starting with a blank whiteboard and finishing up with a thing full of ideas and things crossed out and circles. And, uh, and that's how I think and, and create, honestly, is kind of that, uh, that tactile uh, and visual uh, yeah. way of, of, of writing out your problems and your resources and, and figuring out a way through it. And, you know, it's interesting because Da Vinci was most best known for making knowledge visible. And he was kind of the first person to start kind of mapping things out in a way that people could actually look at it. It was knowledge made visible. And so it sounds like that's exactly what you're doing, which is, which is highly creative. When you use the word innovative, what do you think of? I'm going to, I'm going to steal a tagline from one of our marketing teams uh, from a few years ago, and I loved it because it does encapsulate it. And I think innovation is shaping the future. Mm -hmm. Our marketing team came up with that great line. It says, we shape the future. And to me, that is exactly what innovation is. Mm -hmm. When you innovate, you come up with a new idea that turns into something, whether it's a process improvement or whether it's a new product that I can sell. I'm changing something. I'm changing the way the organization works. I'm changing the way uh, people interact with our technologies. I am shaping what the future looks like. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great opportunity. If you have the opportunity to innovate, if your company lets you apply resources and time against it, you get the opportunity to shape the future, to change how things are going to become. And to me, that's what innovation is. It's a great tagline. I like it. Thank you. Um, So advice for people who want to be more creative or want to innovate. I'll give general advice that I think applies. And my advice is to be intellectually curious. Never lose the curiosity that you had when you were a kid who, when you were never afraid to ask a thousand questions. <laughs> and and I, I will preface a lot of conversations I have at work with, okay, dumb question guy, I'm here. I hear my questions mm-hmm. uh, because that's how you learn, right? Yeah. I'm not an engineer by training, but I work with a lot of engineers. Mm-hmm. So they're now used to me asking dumb questions because I'm trying to figure out, okay, well, what, how does this really work? Why does it, mm-hmm. why, did, why did we design it this way? Oh, because this customer requirement was X and oh, because it doesn't work this other way, whatever. Yeah. But I believe being curious is a key and a fundamental attribute of a good business person mm-hmm. and a good corporate citizen. Mm-hmm. If I'm not curious about how my company works, if I'm not curious about how the finances work, about how our supply chain works, about how our quality system works, how can I, as I move up in the organization, make well-informed, rational decisions that incorporate all of those different components of our enterprise? And if you think about it in your daily life too, if you, when you're learning to drive, when you're 15 or 16 years old, hopefully you're curious about how the car works. Mm-hmm. You'll become a better driver if you understand what the transmission is doing. Mm-hmm. You don't have to be able to build one, but at least you should understand what it does. You should be just generally curious. Mm-hmm. And I really believe that 
whether or not your role is one of an innovator per se, um, or any other role in any other organization, it's beneficial to have a, have a healthy dose of curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, I would totally agree. And that begs the question, what are you curious about now, John? You know, in a broader context, I'm really curious how the pandemic and the ensuing recession is going to play out. Mm -hmm. We are working very hard to develop different scenarios uh, for each of our different market market segments mm -hmm. around uh, growth or contraction and the timing of all of it. Right now, there's a lot of uncertainty in the marketplace and our business is seeing a lot of uncertainty, but this will end. Uh, the pandemic will be behind us. We will go into a recovery mode. What's that recovery going to look like? Mm -hmm. And what are the permanent changes, structural changes, societal changes, uh, socioeconomic changes that are going to ensue as a result? Mm -hmm. And then what are the opportunities yeah. that are associated with those changes? If we're at an inflection point now, then there are going to be opportunities uh, coming up in the next six months, 18 months, because there are always opportunities out of a change event, out of an inflection point. What will they be? I'm really curious to see how all of this plays out. If you are in the trade show business, you know, you're a sponsor, you, you derive your revenue from putting on trade shows. Has your business fundamentally changed forever because of this? Or are things gonna go back the way they were? Or is it gonna be some sort of hybrid? Should I now get into the augmented and virtual reality business and mm -hmm. simply conduct all of my trade shows using AR? Maybe. Mm -hmm. right? Is that an opportunity or is that a fool's errand? I, I don't know the answer to that. And I, I'm not in the trade show business either. So fortunately, <laughs> that's not my charge to figure that out. But I'm curious about how that works out. And I'm curious about how all of this plays out over the next uh, year to two years. It'll be and beyond. It'll be interesting to see. Mm -hmm. It certainly will be interesting to see, and um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a great, I mean, it, it covers so many areas. It, it just covers so many areas right now. Um, I want to ask you, best advice you ever received? I'll give you one that I've ever received, and then best advice that I never took, um, which I don't think you should take. So the best advice I ever received was basically, don't be a purist don't see things only as black and white. Whatever you learn in school, whatever school you're in, could be a, a technical school or it could be business school, whatever you're doing, you're gonna necessarily learn uh, a particular curriculum. You're going to learn the sort of the way things are done in an absolute fashion or in a vacuum, but the world doesn't work that way. The world isn't black and white, there are shades of gray. Mm -hmm. And the wisdom is in the shades of gray. I fundamentally believe that. So just because you or your organization have always done something some way, or just because you were taught to do something in a particular fashion, mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean that fits the, the situation in which you find yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't be a purist or a prisoner to what you were taught. Think for yourself, look for the gray area, and you might find a better way through or a better, pro or a better solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. so that was the advice that I would say, and it, it, it fits, I think, pretty much any walk of life. You don't want people who are dogmatically just black or white um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the way they see things. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the other advice I received, which I think is bad advice, and I went against it, fortunately, um, is don't volunteer for anything. I have volunteered for things that I knew nothing about for years mm -hmm. and I've benefited from it. In business, I think it's really important to raise your hand and be willing to take on a new task, mm -hmm. even if you're not an expert in it. And even if you're not sure what it entails or how you're going to execute it. So I would suggest that people volunteer. Uh, the, the, the thing that people don't realize is that even before the pandemic and the recession, public companies in the United States were operating pretty lean. Uh, there hasn't been a tremendous amount of growth across a broader economy. So to continue to improve profits and earnings, 
uh, companies have boosted their margins by cutting costs over the last 20 years or even more so, right? So you lean and Six Sigma and Kaizen and everything is a drive towards efficiency. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of times that drive towards efficiency eliminated heads. What happened is you don't have a lot of people sitting around in corporate America today with nothing to do. Everybody is fully engaged. Mm -hmm. So when I have a new project that comes along or I have something that needs to be undertaken, something that has to get done, who do we look to? I don't have a bench strength of people to go do it. So I need somebody who's willing to step up, raise their hand and say, yeah, I'll volunteer to do that. I understand that it's extra work. It won't be forever, but I understand that I'll learn a lot from doing it. I'll yes. gain broader experience in the organization and I might do something that helps the company and helps myself as well. And I promise you, at least in our culture, Curtis Wright, those kinds of folks are valued and appreciated and it's noticed when, pe when somebody's willing to step up and take on a new challenge. So, so I say volunteer. Um, as long as you have the bandwidth to do it and uh, then knock yourself out. That is great advice. Absolutely. Um, so in wrapping up, I wanted to ask you, what is it that I should have asked you but didn't? Well, I'm sitting here in Charlotte. You're down. Uh, you work for Clemson. So <laughs> the Charlotte football team are the Carolina Panthers. And I think you should have asked me if the Panthers are going to draft Trevor Lawrence, the Clemson quarterback, a year from now. And should they? Um, you know, if we play poorly enough, we might be able to draft him. So I think that's a, that's a strategy that the, uh, the ownership is looking at and the, and the coaches are looking at it. Just like we're trying to figure out our business strategy, they're trying to figure out theirs as well. But it'll I'm be sure they are. Well, is that the is that at the end of his third year? Yes, yeah, right. He should be eligible for the draft after this coming year, correct? It will and be he's, and he's probably going to graduate after after the after three years. Because, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, no, because he's so smart. He's supposed to actually graduate, have enough credits to graduate. I checked with sources uh, about this because. I, I was curious, and I think he actually, after three years, is, is actually able to graduate. So there, are, there actually are many people kind of close to him who think that he might go after three years. Oh, I'm confident he will. I mean, I, you know, Although, but I, I, I don't know, but, I, but I'd be surprised. I think the, the, the money is on him declaring for the draft and, and going after three years for sure. Um, he's such a tremendous talent. He is. Why wouldn't you? So, and such a good and such a good person too. That always helps to have both. Yeah. Oh, for sure. No question. No yeah. Question. Well, that's a great question, and um, good luck with that. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> John, I can't thank you enough for joining us. It was it's such a pleasure. I love what you're doing at Curtis Wright, and um, uh, I want to hear more about it. And hopefully, we will speak to our class sometime this summer. Well, I would be happy to. It was uh, definitely a pleasure to meet you and thank you for having me and, and good luck with the podcast and the program for sure. Thank you, John. Take care. Bye. Bye.